Dear aspirants, welcome to Daily Current Affairs brought to you by New IAS. Today is 6th October 2018 and we will be discussing all these topics. So, let us start one by one. So, our first news reads like, Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of goods and service tax, saying it was not beyond the legislative competence of parliament. It also held that cess is permissible under the law. So, Supreme Court is of the opinion that Parliament did not misuse any of its power in that particular legislation. Okay? So, that particular legislation cannot be regarded as a colorable legislation. So, we have to understand the concept called colorable legislation. Actually, colorable legislation is, is, a, is a, it's a doctrine devised by Supreme Court of India to interpret various constitutional provisions. Okay? So, like many other tools which Supreme Court used to used to avoid the attempts to subvert the constitution, this, this doctrine also uh, check at times it will uh, work as a check and balance. Okay? So, against, against legislations which are under question, Supreme Court will check the validity of this doctrine, whether that particular legislation qualify as a colorable legislation or not. And now Supreme Court held that GST Compensation Act, compensation to states by levying uh, tax on tax, which is says is not falling under the category called uh, colorable legislation. So, that legislation is fine. Okay? So, let us analyze, let us understand more about colorable legislation. So, colorable legislation, before, before moving on to colorable legislation, because colorable legislation is again a, 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 a doctrine built upon the doctrine of separation of power. So, let us understand those two concepts called separation of power and division of power. Okay? These are the two concepts which you may come across quite often while you study polity. Okay? So, what exactly is division of power and separation of power? Division of power often refers to, I mean, uh, delegation of power. Whenever you come across the term division of power, the first thing that should come to your mind is uh, federalism. Federalism, you are all familiar with the concept called federalism. Federalism means dividing a bigger polity into different tiers, okay? say two tiers, a central government and its subsequent state government. That is federalism and that is division of power. Okay? So, what is separation of power? Under division of power, there are different power, power blocks like legislative, executive, judiciary, election commission, Reserve Bank of India. All are actually I mean, all have their own autonomy under their under their concerns, peers. But they should not they should not exceed their autonomy. They should not exceed their juris, jurisdiction. So all these power blocks uh, should work as a check and balance system. Okay, this is separation of power. So this colorable 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 legislation is also a doctrine built upon the concept of separation of power. Okay? So, let us know. So, what is colorable legislation? If the state exceeds its legislative competency in making a law under the color or gaze of power conferred on it for one particular purpose, it is called colorable legislation. And this doctrine comes into play when a legislature does not possess the power to make law upon a particular subject but nonetheless indirectly makes one. That means actually the legislature is not supposed to make such a legislation, but somehow it managed to make a law by making use of the powers conferred on it. Okay? So, it, it, it can be or it is considered as an attempt to subvert the constitution under this doctrine. And this doctrine is also called fraud on the constitution. See, GST, GST as you all know, all the pre-existing, uh, all the all the erstwhile indirect taxes were subsumed into one regime called GST, and uh, taxes that can be levied by state governments. The sale tax, sale tax also moved under the ambit of GST. So the consensus, so as as part of a consensus, the compensation was agreed upon. Now Supreme Court actually upheld uh, the compensation to state act to levy extra tax called cess to compensate the states is, is not a misuse of the legislative power of a power given to the parliament. 
it is actually constitutional valid and hence it is not uh, a colorable legislation ok. So, this is all about uh, colorable legislation let us move on to the next topic. So, moving on our next news is Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize for the year 2018 has been announced. The Nobel Peace Prize for 2018 has been awarded to Congolese gynecologist Dr. Denis Mukwege and SED human rights activist Nadia Murad for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. Okay. So, let us see the laureates one by one. Dr. Denis Mukwege, he is actually a gynecologist by profession. He founded a hospital that helps survivors of sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He treated thousands of sexual violence victims. He is often called as Dr. Miracle for his ability to repair the damage inflicted on women due to rape. And he holds, he is now holding a record. He is the first Congolese to win the Nobel Prize award. And the laureate too is Nadia Murad. Nadia Murad is a Yazidi rights activist. In 2016, UN appointed her as goodwill ambassador for dignity of survivors of human trafficking. She was actually held as a sex slave by the Islamic State. Actually, later she explained her experiences. I mean, she has openly and courageously spoken about her sufferings at the hands of IS. And she is again the first Iraqi awardee of the Peace Prize. And... Uh, one important point about Nobel Peace Prize is that it is announced outside Sweden. I mean, it is not any of the Swedish academies, academies which is announcing the Peace Prize. Peace Prize is actually announced by Norwegian Nobel Committee. Peace Prize is announced by the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Okay, so this is all about this particular news. Okay, so read the next news. It is saying that National Real Estate Development Council has signed a memorandum of understanding with Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs to provide skill training and jobs in construction sector for 2.5 lakh poor people. Yesterday also, we have discussed about the necessity of liberating manpower from the primary sector. Okay, So, those manpower which, which shall be liberated should be placed on, on another sector. So, construction or real estate is a booming sector and this memorandum of understanding which, which has been signed between these two entities is actually planning to provide skill development, skill training to 2.5 lakh people in construction sector. Okay? So, learn more about this uh, NARETCO, National Real Estate Development Council. As the name suggests, it is the apex national body for real estate industry. Okay? So, it provides a single platform uh, for be it government, industry or public, it provides that single platform to discuss various problems and opportuni opportunities for speedy resolution of issues. Okay? It is headquartered in New Delhi and it is an autonomous self-regulatory body and it is under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs okay? and it was established in the year 1998. Okay? All these factual informations are provided in the material. Uh, please go through it. Moving on, the next news is about IORA and Delhi Declaration on Renewable Energy. The news reads like, as many as 21 countries in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, adopted the Delhi Declaration on Renewable Energy. The Delhi Declaration on Renewable Energy actually calls for collaboration among IORA member states in meeting the growing demand for renewable energy in the region. Okay? So, let us know more about this association called IORA. IORA or Indian Ocean Rim Association, it is actually an intergovernmental organization. Okay? And it was established on March 7, 1997. So, while studying IORA, some key information you should know about this particular organization. The one thing which we have already discussed, it is an intergovernmental organization. Actually, this idea of establishing such an organization was put forward for the first time by late President Nelson Mandela of South Africa. Okay, while he was making a he was making a visit to India. The next thing you should know about IORA is its earlier name. Okay, it is 
it was formerly known as Indian Ocean Rim Initiative and Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, okay, IORARC. And it consists of coastal states bordering the Indian Ocean. And it is actually working on the principles of open regionalism and like any intergovernmental organization, it is also having an apex body. For example, uh, ministerial committee is the apex body of WTO and when it comes to IORA, its apex body is called Council of Foreign Ministers. They meet annually and its secretariat is located in Ebony, Mauritius, okay. So these are the factual information, factual points which you have to keep in mind. And you should understand one more thing, this Indian Ocean region, the significance of this association, okay. Because being the third largest ocean, uh, I mean woven together by trade routes, uh, this Indian Ocean region uh, is carrying out half of the world's container ships and almost one third of the world's bulk cargo traffic and two thirds of the world's oil shipment, okay. So such a vital maritime location is this uh, Indian Ocean region, okay. So that highlights the significance of an association called IORA. So next news is regarding GI tagging. The news is that to the list of fruits with a GI tagging in India, there is a new addition, Alfonso mango. So the news reads like, Alfonso mango from Ratnagiri, Sindhudurg, Palgar, Thane and Raiga districts of Maharashtra is registered as geographical indication. And about Alfonso mangoes, it is often regarded as king of mangoes. It is well known for its pleasant fragrance and vibrant color. So more about GA tagging. A geographical indication or GA tagging is a sign used on the products that have a specific geographical origin and possess qualities or a reputation that are due to that origin. Okay. And it is given primarily for agricultural, natural or handicraft products originating from a definite geographical territory. And the first product to get a GI tag in India was the Darjeeling tea in 2004. And the most important point which you have to keep in mind in relation to geographical indication is that if you make a comparison with trademarking, geographical indication cannot be licensed, okay. So geographical indication cannot be licensed and uh, those products which are having geographical indication, the people who are carrying out businesses in those products or carrying out trade in those products can use this tag, I mean can use the privilege of this tagging to prevent its use by a third party. And uh, uh, moving on, geographical indications are covered as an element of intellectual property rights. We all know India is a member of World Trade Organization. So we are obliged to certain rules put forward by World Trade Organization. Some, some of the agreements are obligatory in nature, nature and while some others are optional in nature. So WTO agreements are of two types, uh, multilateral agreements and plurilateral agreements. Multilateral agreements are actually mandatory agreements. We have no option uh, but to follow, but to abide with those agreements. And when it comes to plurilateral agreement, it is optional, okay. So in relation to GA tagging, which is actually falling under the ambit of intellectual property rights, there is a multilateral agreement called TRIPS, Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights, Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights, that is TRIPS, okay. Since India is a signatory of WTO, we have enacted the Geographical Indications of Goods Act 1999 and it has come into effect from 15th September 2003. So in India, GA tagging is given by the Registrar of Geographical Indications. So that body is known as a Registrar of Geographical Indications in India. And uh, the cell for IPR Promotions and Management, CPAM, under the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, DIPP, is the nodal agency for GIs and IPRs in India. So when it comes to intellectual property rights, or when it comes to geographical indications, you have to keep in mind a very important department, okay. That department is Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, DIPP, okay. So this is all about 
geographical indication and the recent addition uh, into the list of fruits uh, holding GI tag which is uh, Alfonso mango and also in the material uh, the list of uh, the list of fruits that have already entered into the I mean uh, already awarded with the GI tagging has been given and also some previous year questions which have been which has been asked in UPSC is also provided there uh, based on the points we we have discussed uh, in this session please try to work out all those questions okay so keep in mind unlike a trademark GI tagging cannot be licensed so moving on to our regular programs we have our map aided program abbreviated as map and actually we have been discussing about biosphere reserves in India that to under the global list global list of biosphere reserves we have so far discussed Nilagiri biosphere reserve, Gulf of Manar, Nanda Devi biosphere reserve and Sundarbans biosphere reserve. Today we will be discussing about Nokrak biosphere reserve. First of all its location. Nokrak is located in the Garo hills in the northeastern state of India which is Meghalaya. Okay, and it is the part of Thura range of Meghalaya Plateau. These are some factual informations. Please keep in mind. It is a highly mountainous area. It is a highly mountainous area, and it is part of Eastern Himalayas. Okay, yesterday we have discussed Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve, which is part of Western Himalayas. Now it is part of now this Nokrak is part of Eastern Himalayas, and. Uh, when it comes to the major species that are protected under this Nokrak Biosphere Reserve, Hulo Gibbon, Golden Langur and Slow Loris. Okay, so these are the major species protected under this Biosphere Reserve. Can you identify or can you notice anything special about all these animals? They are all arboreal animals. Okay, they are all arboreal animals. You can, you can see elongated limbs, long tails. Okay, arboreal animals are those animals which spend most of their time on trees. They eat, they play, they do everything on trees. Okay, so for the same reasons they develop some adaptations like they have this kind of elongated limbs, their vocal cord will be adapted for making loud noises. Okay, so this is all about the species. Uh, that are protected under Nokrak Biosphere Reserve. As I have mentioned, Nokrak is in the state, northeastern state Meghalaya, and this is the map of Meghalaya, and you can see Nokrak over here. So, this is the general map of uh, the Biosphere Reserve. By now, you are actually familiar with the classification, I mean, the zonal classification inside Biosphere Reserves. Biosphere reserves are divided into three zones, core zone, buffer zone and transition zones. You are all familiar with that. And there is a, one thing I have forgot to tell you, there is a, there is a important protected area inside the Nokrak Biosphere Reserve, which is also having the same name, that is Nokrak National Park, okay. And this Nokrak, Nokrak National Park is situated in the very core zone of this biosphere reserve, in the very core zone of this biosphere reserve. Moving on, the major rivers flowing through Nokrak biosphere reserves are River Ganol, River Darang and River Simsang. Okay. Then UNESCO included this Nokrak biosphere reserve into the list of global network of biosphere reserves in the year 2009. So this is all about Nokrak biosphere reserves. So moving on to our final session. PQRS previous question revision series. Today we are discussing a question that has been asked in the last prelims examination that is 2018 prelims examination from the topic science and technology. Read the question. It is about India's satellite launch vehicles. With reference to India's satellite launch vehicles, consider the following statements. Statement 1. PSLVs launch the satellites useful for earth resources monitoring, whereas GSLVs are designed mainly to launch communication satellites. Satellites launched by PSLV appear to remain permanently fixed in the same position in the sky as viewed from a particular location on earth. Statement 3 reads like GSLV MK3 is a four-staged launch one vehicle 
with the first and third stages using solid rocket motors and the second and fourth stages using liquid rocket engines. Which of the statements given above is are correct? Okay. So, this is a multi statement questions. Yesterday, we have practiced elimination technique in a multi statement question. Okay. So, similarly, today we will see we can apply if we can really apply elimination technique and arrive at the correct answer. Okay. So, it is about India's satellite launch vehicles. By knowing what exactly PSLV and GSLV, one can arrive at the answer. So, let us discuss. So, let us understand what is PSLV and what is GSLV. PSLV, ISRO developed PSLV to launch satellites into polar orbits. And PSLV, PSLVs launch the satellites useful for earth resources monitoring. And when it comes to GSLV, ISRO developed GSLV to launch geosynchronous satellites into geostationary orbits. And geostationary satellites orbit around the earth in 24 hours and since the earth rotates with the same period, the satellite would appear fixed from any point on the earth. Okay. And these GSLV satellites are designed mainly to launch communication satellites. So, by knowing this much information about PSLV and GSLV, we can check if, if we can really solve the question. So, the statement 1 is actually correct. PSLV is launching the satellites useful for earth resource monitoring. It is true. And GSLVs are designed mainly to launch communication satellites. It is again true. Statement 2. Satellites launched by PSLV appear to remain permanently fixed in the same position in the sky as viewed from a particular location on earth. It is a false statement. It is the wrong statement. Actually, this is true in the case of GSLV launched satellites. It is not PSLV launched satellites. Okay. So, the statement 2 is wrong. By knowing statement 2 is wrong, we can eliminate option B and option C. So, now the answer will toggle between A and D. So, let us discuss more about GSLV MK3, which is, which is, which is the third statement. GSLV in general, GSLV is a three stage launch vehicle where first two stages are similar to PSLV with the same solid and liquid nature of fuel, but the third stage is completely different. Third stage is cryogenic stage, cryogenic stage. Okay. So, by knowing this much information, we can check the validity of the third statement. In the third statement, it is mentioned that GSLV MK3 is a four stage launch vehicle with the first and third stages using solid rocket motors and the second and fourth stages using liquid rocket engines. Okay, It is absolutely wrong. We have just seen what exactly a GSLV is. So, the third statement is again a wrong statement and the correct answer is option A1 only. So, that is it for the day. Hope you have enjoyed the session. Do subscribe our channel and hit the bell icon so that when and once we upload a new video, you will be notified. Good night. Good luck.